closed session. So if I can have everyone um, rise for a moment of silence and uh, pledge allegiance, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, folks, we have a pretty full agenda, <clears throat> and I may have to do some moving of some things around just to, um, just to give you forewarning. We are going to start with recognition of visitors, and I want to make sure um, you are able to approach um, and talk about any item germane to the role and function of the Board of Education. When I direct, you should stand, give your name, and begin your statement. Uh, people are asked to refrain from making any personal comments regarding any individual, and I reserve the right to limit presentations based on time. So, first up, we have Heather Helenka. I'm Heather Helenka. I live at 343 North Prairie. Um, and I'm speaking uh, not just as a community member, but as a teacher. As teachers, we need to ensure that our classrooms are safe, welcoming, inclusive, and conducive to learning for all of our students and their families. We want children to find joy in the learning that's happening in our schools, not shame. Shame still surrounds many issues, and we can do better. I understand that when considering non-binary gender identities, it can feel unfamiliar and scary for some. But what is not scary or unfamiliar is a child looking to us, the teachers, to set the tone of acceptance and welcome in our schools and classrooms. This could be as simple as including books that portray all kinds of families and people, along with posters or graphics used in our classrooms. We owe it to our children to represent all of them. We need to do this not because it's in our job descriptions or in the district's vision and mission statement or the law, but because it's the right thing to do. I understand that the way forward can be complicated and messy, but we must move forward. I respectfully ask our district leaders to explore and implement teacher training, curricula, and resources that will guide us as we navigate our way towards becoming a safe, welcoming, inclusive place for all. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Next up, we have Julie Williams. Good evening, Dr. Asplin and the Community Board of Education. My name is Julie Williams, and I'm here in regards to an email that was sent to the Galesburg High School seniors in regards to graduation. My daughter is 17, and technically, that does not make her a legal adult. And this email that went out to the students, have you guys read it, or do you need copies? I need copies. Does everybody need one? Can I bring the copies forward? Hold on. Sorry. I have them right here. I wasn't sure how many. I think it's front and back. I apologize okay. for the huge um, typing, but I have printed my daughter's, <laughs> and it was the way it went through. Uh -huh. You're welcome. I'll give you each a couple of minutes to read it so that when I um, speak, you'll know what I'm in reference to. Did you? Okay, sorry. I thought that I needed one to you. to the senior class um, was sent a week ago. And in regards to which graduation date they would prefer to have. My first question to you is, 
Since when are seniors allowed to choose their preference uh, graduation date? And why was this sent to a senior class and not the parents and not the staff? As a mom, I only found out about it because my daughter came to me and asked me about it. This is a lifetime event for our children, and so parents should be involved with those decisions. Second of all, I, I really don't understand why this is an issue after school has started. As a parent, at this point in the year, it is assumed that graduation will be the same day as it has always been. We've already bought airline tickets for families, booked hotel rooms, um, scheduled graduation parties, and then in September, it's being, this is being brought up after, without a reason. And I read your newspaper paper article that it was because of construction. I have to say that if that was the issue, that was known before the start of the school year. And it should have been addressed at that time. Also, um, there are a lot of graduations the weekend of May 16th, Monmouth College has their graduation, United High School has their graduation. At this late of a notice, there won't be hotel rooms available in anywhere in this area. Monmouth College brings in a lot of parents and families that don't live in the area. Also, um, if, if you read the email like I did, it was very deceiving. At the beginning of the email, it reads that the last day for the seniors is May 15th either way. The May 15th date is again listed where they give the option of the May 16th graduation day, but if you notice, it's not by the 24th. My daughter is 17, and that's going to pop out. If you see May 16th and whoo, I get out May 15th, they're going to choose that one. And because they're not adults yet, that they read carefully through the whole thing. It's kind of right there, they have to make a choice, and they say it shows that May 15th is the last state. That's what they're gonna go with. I've asked parents, and they've asked their children, and that's how their children have responded. Also, who sent the email? It's a do not reply. And so I guess the reason I'm here and not talking to high school administration is because I didn't know who sent it. I asked teachers. I went to teachers to see if they knew anything about it. There wasn't one staff member at the high school that I spoke with that knew the email was sent. Was it administration? I don't, I mean, I just said they didn't have anything. Was it somebody from the Board of Education? Has this been discussed before with you guys? The email also reads that the reason they don't want to have that you don't want to have it on May for somebody again I don't know who sent it on May 24th because there will be limited parking and construction and seating once again with all of this plan of getting all of these schools ready why was that not thought of before the school year started so that it can be announced that graduation will be at a different date this is one special day for every child as they grow up. They've worked 13 years to be able to graduate. They want their families there. They want their parents there. The parents want to be there with them. <laughs> Pictures are always taken on the front lawn. How would the 16th and the 24th make a difference if you have uh, time for space for your pictures? It's always on the front lawn. The construction's not going to be right there on the front lawn. Also, as far as seating and parking, school is still going to be just finishing that week. If you're not starting school until later in September next year, couldn't have curious courtesy for the students, the seniors, and their families. You wait or you make it available so that we can still hold graduation on the 24th. If there has to be a change, couldn't it be in the next school year and announced before the school year starts? Thank you, Julie. I'm going to ask you to <clears throat> close your comments because it's been past five minutes. Thank you. And I'm open to any questions that you have of me as a parent. Thank you. 
Next we have Diana Sarah. So I thank the board for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I'm backing up Julie's comments. Um, I'm a parent of twins who are graduating this year, so we've got two students. Um, <coughs> luckily, our family, I guess, has two votes in this, this, uh, this email. Uh, my daughter first notified me the day that, um, she never said that there was an email sent and a form sent, but she did text me later in the day and said that there is a question of when graduation is going to happen, um, that they may move it up a week. That was the first time I was notified of this. Um, we heard anything about the possibility. Of Finding the date of graduation, if you are not originally from Guildford, is impossible. I looked on everything I could find to see when it actually is graduation, and it was only by word of mouth that it was passed that it's always been the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. So I called the school and asked to see if that was the case, and I talked to the secretary, and she said, well, I'm pretty sure that's the case. So we made, started to make plans and uh, schedule a, a place to have uh, open house and various different things. We also have family that is completely out of town. My family is from Minnesota, my husband is from Florida, so everybody's coming from out of town and he's, uh, to make plans. Um, so I called the school and she said, well, I'm assuming it's going to be then. And I said, well, I don't know who else to call to ask besides the school. And I said, but there is construction going on and we've been hearing about the construction days. And she said, oh, that's, that's a good point. I better check and make sure. And she took my number and information, and she called me back later and confirmed that, yes, graduation is that Sunday, or, yeah, that Sunday. Uh, so we moved forward with plans, and then uh, two weeks later, we hear that it's possibly moved. It's too late to change a date for uh, the open house, for the graduation open house, because it's already been booked at that time. Um, not only has this date disrupted just graduation, this is kind of the last straw. It's also disrupted the GAP students going to Germany. It's also uh, disrupted the, uh, uh, the band trip um, going to Florida because it's moved back. Um, it's always been spring break and you don't have a spring break. Um, and it's, this isn't with the school, but it's located at the school. The dance recital from here um, can't be scheduled at the school because there is no, no uh, auditorium to be used. And my daughter, unfortunately, is in all those events. She was planning on the band trip. She stayed in band for four years because she was going to go to Florida. She is the drum major this year. Um, she is in dance, and she's been in dance for 13 years, and this would be her final recital. And she wanted, was planning on going on the Germany trip, and they are all the same day because we can't have them in school. Um, so I would ask, please don't also mess with graduation because that's the one thing we thought we had planned for. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, Angela Bastian. Hi, my name is Angela Bastian, and I also um, am here in support of not changing the graduation date. Um, I support what Julie said, what Diana said, and there's a whole host of parents um, that are frustrated uh, about an email or a survey going out to our high school students. Um, I have a son and he's not near as responsible as some of the girls. So I did not hear that the survey even went out to the students and that he um, voted. Um, he couldn't even remember how he voted or why. <laughs> so um, I found out from other parents. So I would respectfully request that the district address this issue with parents as it's caused a lot of chaos um, amongst the senior parents, especially when the tradition, the tradition of our district is that graduation is Memorial Day weekend. Um, I'm a planner, so I will tell you that earlier this summer I already had my plans made. I notified family, some of which run businesses, and they have to block their time off, um, and, and that has already been done. And just like the previous comments that the, the school board set the calendar, um, and if there was any indication that we needed to have a change, it should have came um, in advance as opposed to this time. So I would just, um, again, request um, that you communicate with the parents if this is an issue. The survey needs to go to the parents, not to the students that have um, no skin in the game other than showing up on the date that they're told to be there. Um, the parents do all the work, and like, like Julie said, you know, this is a celebration they've worked hard for, and we pre-planned to make this the best event for them. And um, this just has caused a lot of stress that's unnecessary. Um, 
And so if you would please address it with the parents in the district and let us know what's going on and where this came from. I read the email, it wasn't very professional in nature. It's hard to figure out where it came from, but asking the students um, was definitely not the right approach to this. Uh, but again, my request for being here and representing many of the families or the, the moms that do a lot of planning and are invested in this graduation time is that the date remain the same. And uh, if there are any changes coming in the future that we be notified well in advance of the school year so that we can be proactive and, and make those um, adjustments accordingly. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, Helen McDormand. <coughs> First, I want to say thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'm here as a mom of a transgender student who goes through high school, and I'm here just to say thank you for all the support that you've given my student and other students that are in the LGBT community. Um, having the GSA at the high school and other programs, the continued conversations that we have with the administration um, and members of this board help save lives, help students feel included and be allowed to be themselves. So I just wanted to come and say thank you. Next, Christina Keen. Good evening, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, I don't really have much to say other than what Holly said, but um, also to thank the board um, for making sure that we are protecting our trans and LGBTQ students as a graduate and as a taxpayer of the community, I really appreciate that. Um, I would also ask that there be maybe possibly um, conversations on adding extra training in for those teachers who are maybe unaware or unsure of how to deal with LGBTQ students and issues that do arise from that. Um, I've heard from teachers and students alike that have said that there are inadequacies in the training that they're being given. So I would ask that the board please consider that. Thank you. Because I know <clears throat> I'm gonna suspend agenda for just a moment because I know that many people are here in response to things that were commented on. So I think probably we'll start with the graduation. Sure. Okay. I'll be brief. Uh, so this survey that went out, and honestly I don't know who sent the survey out, but I do know it was sent out from the, from the high school. Um, this survey that sent out was the same survey that was sent out last year with a couple of variations. So uh, last year the students were asked because what maybe a lot of people don't know is there are also a lot of other people who have voiced their concerns that we have graduation so far after the last day of school. And so uh, last year it was sent out to the senior class asking, do you, do you want to think about moving in? Overwhelmingly they said no, so that was the end of it. Uh, another survey was not sent out to the parents or the staff or anything, it was just it stopped there. So this year it was decided, you know, we should probably send that out again, same as last year. Um, and obviously got a different response. Um, last year we never heard from anybody being upset, any concern, if, if, well, if it was voice of the high school, I never heard it. Um, so basically it's the exact same thing we did last year. Now, um, in hindsight, perhaps we just start with the parents next time if we do it at all. Um, but it was just a, uh, basically standard operating procedure from the year before. Um, so it was done uh, with the idea of trying to help people understand that there may be some issues related to construction. Um, and, you know, Galesburg has had graduation, I believe, for 10 years uh, on Memorial Day weekend. So uh, it has been some time. But uh, uh, that I know has been discussed in other years. Uh, there's been some concern with that large gap of time between when seniors ended and when graduation happened. Uh, quite honestly, next year, uh, you know, the issue would be more if they wanted to have it a week later or so on because school's going to start so much later. Um, you know, students are going to get out later as well. So, uh, at this point in time, I, based on the feedback we've gotten, I mean, and, and the thing is we've heard, I shouldn't even say we, I haven't heard it, I know the high school administration has, um, that Obviously, there are some serious concerns with parents and uh, 
the default date has been Memorial Day weekend. But because of some concerns with dust or parking or things like that, uh, we felt in fairness and all transparency that people should know what they might be getting themselves into uh, with having graduation on that weekend, which we can absolutely accommodate. Uh, it's just some, it's just more information. I mean, I guess that's that's where we lie is, it's just getting information for us to make a better decision. Um, and as I said, you should never assume because one year it was no big deal, the next year it wouldn't be. So uh, food for thought for the year after this. But uh, um, based on what we've heard so far, and I've never heard the results from the high school survey, um, but you know, if let's just be real clear, if it had gone to uh, let's say let's say students unanimously voted to have graduation the week before, which didn't happen, I'm sure nothing's ever unanimous. But then it would have to go to the parents and the staff, and then it might stop there uh, because we know that parents get heavily involved in this as well. Um, it was never going to be oh the students voted for it, let's do it. Um, and you know, in hindsight, being 2020, you probably should have had something go out to the parents and say, hey, we're going to survey your kids, and then we'll survey you, and we'll survey the staff, so people didn't get upset needlessly. Uh, so we're sorry for that. But it was really just more information gathering, uh, and that, that was really where it was. So at this moment in time, the, the graduation date is still the 20, I think that's the 24th, uh, the 24th of May, and uh, nothing has been changed. And uh, typically, just I would say this for just in general the board doesn't really set the date for graduation that's more it's more the building um, so you know in, in the future that's really more just a building decision um, we're just trying to get the information out so everybody knows what it is but if we're hearing a lot bless you uh, the people are gonna have a lot of hardships and there's lots of you know plane tickets purchased and all those things obviously that would factor into the decision we don't want to put anybody out. That was never any of it. We just wanted people to know what they might be facing when they get into this. I mean, we're in a, an unusual situation right now, obviously with construction going on. And no, we didn't know uh, when school ended last year that there would be construction going on at the high school to start. We did not know that. Uh, well, well, I actually don't know that until we accept bids. Uh, but that really wasn't decided until this summer, uh, probably mid-July. So. Uh, there was never any intent to make anybody upset. It was really more just to get information. So um, you know, we'll do a better job of making sure people are notified a little earlier before this happens in future years, if it is to happen in future years. Um, you know, every year is a little different story. So um, I understand that there's a tradition here. Um, and always in, in high schools, it's usually about four years. Um, this time it happens to be 10. And uh, you know we need to be cognizant of that as we move forward from here on out. So uh, I would say, from you know, I'm not trying to to ditch the the board from having a discussion about this, but really that is a building decision. The board doesn't set graduation dates. Um, that is a building decision. Sorry, I don't know if I'm out of turn or not. But so you so graduation will be on the 24th. Yes. And then of memorial of that Sunday Memorial Day weekend is. I want to make sure I understood because of what you said, I wasn't sure if I heard you correctly. I would want to make sure we spoke to the high school administration before I gave you a perfect answer on that. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. But I'm sure that will happen soon. Something will go out to parents this week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and to... Um, the requests and the comments for professional development for our teachers, yes. A hundred times, yes. A thousand times, yes. Um, I can only speak for myself and the fact that I've been sitting at this table for five years and the times that I have expressed similar sentiments. So thank you for expressing yours tonight, okay? And it is difficult because this is a business meeting. It's not really necessarily give and take. We sit here, we do business in front of you. So I appreciate you coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I appreciate for those of you who are regulars at our meetings, um, allowing uh, the board to step away from regular business to respond because I don't 
think that everyone necessarily wants to stay for the rest of the meeting, even though I encourage you to do so. It's nice to see so many faces in the room, um, but I do recognize that you know people have things to do and homework and other important things, right? So um, <clears throat> that ends the agenda item four recognitions of visitors. Um, before we move into presentations to the board, I'm gonna also suspend the agenda one more time. Um, Mrs. Ham, what item is it that you want us to consider? Focus area three, item F. Okay. We're gonna move focus area um, number three, responding to the changing needs of our community to uh, an item F, consider approval of resolution providing for the issue of not to exceed $17,250,000 general obligation school bonds for the purpose of paying claims against the district, providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest on said bonds, and authorizing the execution of a bond purchase agreement with Stifle, Nicholas and Company Incorporated in connection with the proposed sale of said bonds. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Mrs. Ham? Yes, thank you. I'm actually going to turn this over to Mr. Hoggy from Stifle and Nicholas, who um, did the um, purchasing agreements and has the final numbers for the board this evening. Thank you. Um, again, pleasure to be with you tonight. Excuse my <coughs> dress, the ties are not in my wardrobe right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ascots are, right? <laughs> Ascots would probably work, yeah. I don't know where to buy them <laughs> Do they make them anymore? Um, we did have a very good sale today uh, on the district's bonds. I think Mrs. Ham did set out some information at, at your places ahead of you. Um, we are actually selling $15.38 million worth of bonds. The purchasers are paying a premium of about $2.453 million, and so the net proceeds will be $17.833 million. Uh, that will fully fund the payoff of the debt certificates. If you remember, we issued debt certificates, and this will repay those debt certificates at $17,147.70. And then we also have money to put in the capitalized interest fund. The district will need to make an interest payment June 1st of 2020. Obviously, that would have had been part of the 2018 levy, and you can't affect that levy now. It's passed. So we've uh, provided for that interest payment as well as part of the proceeds of the bonds, and then the issue of the cost of about $217,000. Um, we ended up with an all-in total uh, true interest cost of 2.546% uh, or about 2.55%. Uh, very, very good in, in the market. Um, the average life is about 7.13 years. I want to commend the district again on its bond rating. You folks have maintained a AA minus rating with S&P. Um, that's higher than the city's rating. That's higher than a lot of the ratings in the area. And that's only because of your strong financial condition, okay? Um, and and it's, it's, that's really what makes up their mind to give you a double A minus rather than an A plus. So you say, okay, well, what difference does that make? Well, that makes about $178,000 worth of interest difference over the life of your bonds. So you're saving your taxpayers $178,000 by maintaining a strong financial position. And so again, that, that, that's a credit to the board, that's a credit to the administration. Uh, to really have turned around the district financially in the last several years from where you would have been. Um, so again, I think, uh, again, I wanted to point that out. We are very pleased with the rating and it certainly helps with the marketing of the bonds as well. Happy to answer any questions you folks have. Uh, the resolution in front of you is what we call a parameters resolution. It sets forth the parameters. We'll be sending up final documents after Chapman completes them for the day's sale and they will need board officer signature later in the week. Any questions from board members? This okay. is the last time we're selling bonds, correct? No. The working cash bonds that we've already done the parameters. Right. Well, we have the working cash bonds. This is the last one we're getting parameters for. We'll sell working cash bonds a year from now. This takes us, I believe, to about forty million in proceeds, and we still have another twelve million to do <coughs> sometime next year. Um. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you um, for the acknowledgement because I know five years when I stepped onto this board, it was a very different financial picture. Yes, it was. 
Um, and I appreciate knowing that all of our hard work and the disagreement and the back and forth and the pain that I went through as a very, very new board member in making some very, very tough decisions has put us into a position to be able to make some different kinds of decisions just five years later. Um, there are no other questions. Allison? Phelps? Rodriguez? Aye. Yeah. Kirby? Yes. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we will move back to the beginning of the agenda where we have presentations to the board. Is the only presentation we have from student council? Okay, go ahead. This one? That top, the white one. There you go. Move it closer. Sorry. Hi. You're <laughs> good. Um, my name is Jakara. I'm the, um, well, I'm Jakara Kelly. I'm a junior at Gillsburg High School, and I'm the corresponding secretary of the student council this year. Um, I'm just here to update you guys on our events. Uh, the first two weeks of school, we had Start With Hello Week, where we had various clubs and fall sports uh, greet the students as I walked in. And then next week, starting the 23rd of September, is Homecoming Week. Our theme this year is Hollywood slash the Oscars. Monday will be College Shirt Day. Tuesday is Tacky Tours Tuesday. Wednesday is Jersey Day and our Powder Puff game, which is at 6 p.m. at the um, in the stadium, which is juniors versus seniors. Uh, Thursday is Visco Girl Day. Friday is Spirit Day, and then we have ho our homecoming assembly at 2 p.m. and the parade is at 4. Then on Saturday, the homecoming dance is at uh, it is from 8 to 11 in the GHS Fieldhouse. We also have a blood drive coming up on October 5th from 1 to 6 in the JHS library and we'll keep you updated on that. So just because I'm putting it in my calendar now because for some reason it was not already in I do not know how. Homecoming, assembly, and parade is on the 27th. Yes, Thank you. that Friday. <coughs> and parents are like welcome to come to the assembly It'll be really cool. The band will play, and the cheerleaders have routines, and the teachers do skits. Any other questions from board members? Right, wonderful. You do not have to stay here. <laughs> it's okay. I didn't know I was supposed to come up here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving on to. Agenda item six, approval of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any items that board members would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Allison. Rodriguez. Aye. Sherby. Aye. Walters. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. Lyon. Yes. Okay, moving to focus area number one, relevant skills that lead to employability. Item A, the administrative report on curriculum. Ms. Springer. Good evening. Uh, you'll see in the report that I presented, uh, we did in fact get 625 kindergarten and first graders assessed on the Ames Web Plus format uh, between the last board meeting and this board meeting. Uh, interventionists and instructional coaches were able to make this happen uh, the September 3rd through, the se through September 10th. So they are evaluating that data at this point. Uh, we will have three district improvement team meetings this year. Our first one will be next week. Uh, we'll have one later uh, in January and then one in May. So we'll have here are our board, here, basically here are our reports and our building plans. Here's where we are halfway through and then a follow up. Did we meet our goals? Do we still have things to work on? Um, and what actionable steps did we take over the course of the year? Uh, instructional coaching team we were able to present and we actually were invited uh, to Knox College on September 3rd per the request of the Sunrise Rotary and we were able to present. 
presentation was related to our instructional coaching practices and the work of the coaches and the data behind the instructional coaching practice. It was well received. Uh, it was a great opportunity to share the program and we had lots of questions and answers and it was it was really exciting to connect with the community members. Uh, we also just, actually I just sent out a survey today which has approximately 90 survey responses already. It's a five question survey. Essentially, there are some informal requests we've had for professional development. What are the needs of the teachers? Some informal requests. Um, so we listed those all out. Uh, we asked what day of the week is best to get this kind of professional development, time of day, before school, after school. Um, and then if there were any other suggestions, you know, are there any other things that we haven't mentioned um, that would be beneficial to you and what's your grade level band? So we want to make sure that if you want reading instruction and you're a K-2 teacher, that's going to look a lot different than 9-12. So those pieces are already come in. I've got 90 and I sent it out at 12-30 today. So really good response. Uh, it will be up through Thursday at noon. We're doing two different pilots. Letters have gone home uh, to parents who, uh, of students who are involved in the pilot. Uh, we're doing Amplify Science, which is what we adopted last year, K through five, six through eight. I had several teachers who were willing to adopt, or to, excuse me, to initiate and implement that pilot this year. Um, and then we have the math pilot, K through 18. I have 16 elementary teachers and six middle school teachers piloting the Ready Math program. Um, so I, I mean, I've been pleasantly surprised about uh, the response. Um, let's see what else. We just had a recent training. Uh, for the middle school teachers, we actually had it planned for the elementary as well, but we got out two hours early, so I'm re rescheduling that one. Um, but the middle school teachers actually sent me a couple of pieces of feedback indicating that they really enjoyed their experience and requested that same trainer come back again um, if given the opportunity. We also had an equity leadership team meet on August 7th with Dr. Paul Borski to discuss equity, inclusivity, and diversity. Um, between his visits, I'm doing a book study with members on the equity team. Um, there's about 35 people, including community members like the United Way, United Against Hate, um, NAACP, uh, a number of community members, Knox College. Uh, but anyhow, books have been shared with the groups of the leadership team. Meeting dates are September 25th, the 23rd, and the 6th. And then that will be just in time for Dr. Gorski to come back on the 19th. So we'll have his book read and be ready to dive in again um, on that date. I believe that is all I have. Any questions from board members? Thank you. All right. Next uh, agenda item B, special education report, Dr. Michelle. Special ed department continues to look for certified special education teachers, paraprofessionals, and subs. Um, we are not having much luck securing certified people. Um, I, attached to my report is our special ed numbers as they currently stand right now. Interesting facts is we finished the year with approximately 663 students. Right now we have 641. We've had 43 in the first three, first three weeks of school and 35 move outs already. So it's just kind of a continuing revolving door. Any questions? questions? questions Is that different than previous years, though? It's very no. similar. Very similar. We'll have a next round, probably around the um, winter break. We'll have another round of... I mean, we have a few throughout the year, but heavy times of the year. Any other questions? Thank you. Next item are the building reports. Did board members have any questions or comments regarding the reports submitted by the individual school administrations? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and then moving into agenda item eight, focus area number two, facilities that assist in skill acquisition. Item A, the building study committees, Dr. Asplin. Thank you. What I, all I really have to report here is uh, we need to have a building and grounds committee meeting and that's member Lyon and member Walters so we'll need to schedule that preferably tonight before we leave um, to find a time to meet whenever obviously works with your schedule we have uh, two really pertinent issues we need to have a little bit closer study on uh, one of them is uh, the schedule committee has been working and um, working very hard and came back with a recommendation um, for seven period a day 
that led into a discussion about uh, the cafeteria and the kitchen size and currently we have been working towards uh, a, a kitchen and cafeteria size that, can, that would really be better used with four lunch periods instead of two and so one of the issues we need to kind of drill down into is how much flexibility do we want and how much are we willing to spend to do it so um, you know, we're trying to get some ballpark figures for you that are a little bit better than ballpark on what ratcheting up the size of those kitchens would mean, or that kitchen would mean. Uh, but we want the building and grounds committee to look at that. Um, and then the other one um, was an issue where we're trying to do due diligence on staging the construction at the high school. And um, that question is, do we want it to take two years or one? And so the scope of that, if you do it over two years, you can use part of the high school, but there's some problems with that in terms of power and water and sewer. Um, or uh, if you go one year, we mean you have to vacate the high school, which Robert, I wanna uh, say that whoever chose to use the words, we're gonna close GHS next year, I would, I would like to talk to them. Uh, no need to scare people. Uh, we're still going to have a high school, uh, it just might not be in the building. Uh, so uh, we're talking about uh, that possibility. So is that a realistic possibility? We're just trying to do our due diligence and figure every eventuality out so that we want to study every possibility uh, and see what the, uh, the positives and negatives of that are. So we feel that we're not doing our jobs if we don't try to put out every different scenario. Um, and so we want the building and grounds committee to look at that. So how much do we want to vacate the high school? What would that cost? What are the benefits of that? There are some budgeting benefits to being out for a year. I think we could all just sit here and name the detractions of being out for a year. Um, but financially speaking, what's it worth to us? So we want the building and grounds committee to study those two issues. So to reiterate that, we actually have not come to a decision about when or how we will be using the high school as soon as next fall, contrary to some already highly discussed conversations via social media and even presented here this evening. That decision has not been made. It is being discussed, as you just heard. Thank you. So, uh, as we've said up here before, democracy is messy. This is what democracy looks like. It's messy. So, we're going to try to go through everything um, I, I also want to just kind of put one other thing out there that there's always a call for us to be as transparent as possible. This is what transparency looks like. So we're going to talk about all sorts of stuff, all right? And some people are going to get ticked, but we feel like it's better to talk about it out in the open than to go, well, let's have a committee meeting and not really tell you what we're talking about. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, and we just want people to understand that it's a process and we're trying to work through that process and we use the committee structure to help better inform the board and there's positives and negatives to both sides of all of those things. It would be great to have a really huge kitchen uh, then we could have all sorts of flexibility. That'll take money away from other parts of the project. Whatever that would be, we'd have to make that decision later. Um, it would be great to uh, be able to stay in the high school while we do a lot of the construction, but that comes with dangers and inconveniences and higher expenses and you know, there isn't a right answer okay um, there's just what do we value more so do we want to spend more money on this or that or spend more time on this or that and typically there's uh, there's a dichotomy of time and money and so if you want more time it costs you more money uh, you know that kind of thing so uh, we're going to work through those those problems and you know we have to work on it as we go we use this term before and we'll continue to use it. We're building the bridge as we walk on it. So uh, we don't have all the answers. We're just trying to get them uh, through as much fact finding as humanly possible. I also think it's important for the community to understand that while that conversation is directed about the <clears throat> facilities at the high school, all of these decisions are dominoes and affect every single other decision and how quickly or slowly we're able to move on the other projects that we have going on. This is not just about one building. It is not just about one building's staff. It is an entire district of puzzle pieces 
that we are trying to move around and any decision that isn't made in a timely fashion can impact the elementary schools and can, can impact the middle schools. So I just wanna make that clear. This is not about one building and one building staff. It is about an entire district and what is best for all of our staff and all of our students. Next agenda item B, update on district building projects. Dr. Asplund. Thank you. We are going to be sending out to all staff members uh, uh, basically a, a preference sheet. So I'm looking at Brett, you have to be sitting there. So Brett will get something in his mailbox, or Heather, they'll get something in their mailbox that'll say, uh, what grades do you want to teach? What subjects do you want to teach? Give us your top two preferences. And then for um, you know the K6 people, what building would you prefer to teach in? You know, we want to make sure that we cover all those things. Uh, we're still working through the process for how we're going to make that decision. Um, and I'm going to send something out to the staff because I've only gotten one person's feedback so far. I know it should be that. It was a good idea, but it was just one person. Um, and we would love to make it a goal to have staff know within reason uh, where they would be working next year before we leave on winter break. So we think that that would bring a lot of piece to a lot of staff members and say, okay, this is at least, you know, given student population stays what we think student population is going to be, we believe this is where you'll be assigned next year. So we'd like to get that done sooner rather than later um, so that um, people can have some peace of mind knowing what the future will hold for them. Questions from board members? I'm glad you're making this happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, we would like to, you know, we'll get up some other discussions here in a little bit about district boundaries. That's similar. Uh, we feel like we know all these decisions have to be made. There's no point in dragging them out. Okay. Next, consider approval of controls recommendation. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Ms. Sam. In front of me this evening, you have a recommendation from Russell Construction um, that the district move forward with ECSI, um, which is automated controls that would be um, installed in all of our buildings um, as part of new construction. And then we're going to do actually an overlay on Silas Bullard so that all of our HVAC systems are under one control system and can be um, controlled under a common software program, which is not the case currently. So we currently have um, automated controls in some of our buildings, um, and we felt that for the value and for the quality of the service and the product that this was um, the best choice for the district to move forward. Questions so, for Mrs. Sam? Yes. Is it all on our servers that go through a second party or? It go, it's all on ours and we control all of the network and the data on that. But they can also then um, log in if we're having issues and see what those issues are from a remote location so we don't have to pay for a service call um, on certain certain items. <clears throat> they have access all the time or just so we grant access? Um, I believe they have access all the time but they don't have access to change anything. They have access to view the control systems. The, Isn't that right correct? Now they, right now the district has that portal turned off, so the only way to view it is if you're in. But we're changing that. Yeah, it's just a switch. That's a tech like issue. A, a VPN switch, but the, the district, I think actually purchased ECSI's control software back when we did the field house. Um, and that's why Lombard's, the existing Lombard, the existing Steve Steel, and the existing Field House are all on ECSI's program. Um, so the recommendation tonight is to, we, we talked last time about foregoing the decision on the controls um, award alternate on Lombard and Steel until we vetted out train or ECSI to have a good solution. So this would bring, the decision tonight would allow us to then take the controls of those other two buildings Steel and Lombard and keep them there, and then give you the option to bring Silas on as well. So it is, it's a web-based control where you type it in and you can see any building and there's different permission levels. So whether someone just has permission to view where temperature set points is, I know your facility, um, 
the district facility manager is pretty works well in the system now and likes it. And it's, it's worked well for And this recommendation does not require moving Willard over at this point, or it is? I, it is in the cost of the estimate, but we're not going to do it at this time. We're going to wait until we finish all the other projects, just because there's no urgency, because we're working on multiple systems anyways. So. But by the time the projects are all over, we'll all be on one platform for all of the buildings. Correct. That was the goal, yeah. Any other questions? And just one other point, you can see in here that even with migrating Silas over, that we still ended up saving money from the train system, so. Okay. Allison? Sherby? Aye. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. Next, consider approval of commissioning subcontract recommendations. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Mr. Sam. Okay, this is a recommendation to um, go forward with IMEG for commissioning services at both Lombard and Steele Elementary Schools. Commissioning services, in essence, very simply, um, is an outside firm that vets all of our electrical HVAC systems to ensure that they're in compliance with how they were to be installed with subcontractors and that they're working to the capabilities that they were supposed to and they were specced out in. So this is very common. Um, we always hire a commissioning um, agent to come in and to do this and this is who Russell is recommending. Can you explain that again? Is it because we don't trust who we're hiring? No. Is that what no. It's actually a code um, requirement that you have third party commissioning testing agency. It's kind of like, if you think about uh, material testing, we hire a third party material tester to review soil and that type of stuff. It's the same type of thing that you hire a commission agent to come and validate the engineer's design and the contractor that installed correctly and it's working correctly at the end. So it's like kind of final like verification step and it's a code requirement on new buildings that lighting systems and HVAC systems, domestic hot water systems will have to be commissioned. We went to four different firms, got pricing. Um, IMAG was the lowest responsible, um, the lowest ones because we only went to people that we trusted. And uh, they actually formerly were known as KJWW um, before they merged. And that's who did Silas Willard as well. So this would be their Quad City office. Um, they also have Chicago office and different ones. But the main commission text would be not either Chicago or Quad City. Said they were the lowest bid. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Alice. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Klein? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. Sherby? Aye. Next, consider approval of the King Elementary bid specifications. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <coughs> Mrs. Hingham. Okay, we had a um, scope gap in um, our Silas Willard bid. Um, there needed to be work done on a sewer line that extended. Steel. Steel. What did I say, Silas Willard? Willard. Willard? Thank you. I apologize. Yes. Wait, we're at the, Wait, we're we're at the King, King Elementary, elementary bid. bid. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long bid. The other elementary Wrong school, school, wrong bid. Okay, All right. so we're at the King Elementary bid. So this bid recommendation. Um, Oh, okay. Thank you. That was that extra. Thank you. Yeah, it's fine. That's giant. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. Um, so today we're asking for approval on the bid specs for concrete, earthwork, and for steel fabrication only for uh, King School. So we're in the process of working with the city on a couple other items, one of them being a traffic study. So we don't want to move forward with final. Um, parking lot and drop off lane recommendations until after that traffic study and we've kind of vetted a couple concerns that have been brought to our attention so we do need to get the steel ordered ASAP so that we can be on a construction schedule so that is what the board is approving tonight but package one for King questions Lee can you describe how we're building this building yeah so if uh 
So this is bid package one. So what we're going for bid right now is for all the, the building pad, the foundations, the concrete, and the structural steel. Um, structural steel is the longest lead time of any building material right now um, to get through shop drawings and fabrication. So looking at the overall design schedule, um, we're looking to go up for a bid on the rest of the King in uh, November, which would put us too late to get the addition done, um, kind of push the unable. So the, the best way we could figure out how to schedule to get the addition done is to pull out the structural steel and concrete award that early. So we'll be coming back next month asking for approval of those contractors so we can start on earthwork and get structural steel going while we bid out the rest. Um, if any of you guys were around when we did Silas Willard, we did the same thing. We had three bid packages on that one to get the schedule worked in the, as well on that one as well. Kind of beat winter and get the steel coming. So what you're voting on tonight is to go out for bid for structural steel, fab and erection, and then the, all the concrete and building related earthwork only. So. so then your recommendation would be that we would have bids available to look at next month Yes. So and accept something hopefully. Yep. So that something would be they would start digging first of November. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, because we'd be accepted in the middle of October, give you a couple weeks to get on site. I'd expect yeah, first of November to start digging and you know get foundate get a building pad built and foundation started. So we get those in before winter. <sighs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments besides the collective size from the board? <laughs> <laughs> I trust it. Mm -hmm. It's so stressful. Mm -hmm. It is. <clears throat> that's why I was sorry we had to buy this commissioning service. I would hope that's what you check. <laughs> but, hey, I mean, in this case, I guess I appreciate that the law requires us to do another check. I don't know. Are there any other questions? Allison. Cervantes? Aye. Lyons? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. Shirley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Next, consider approval of change order for Steel Elementary. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <laughs> <laughs> this is the steel discussion now. This is a steel discussion, and this is for the change order. So any change order with our projects that is over $10,000 will be bringing it to the board for approval. And so this was a gap in the scope of work um, that was not picked up in the original design development. So there's a sewer line that needs to be replaced um, that goes out onto Main Street. We had two bidders, Iron Hustlers at 32,000 and Pipco at 51,520. Russell's recommending that we move forward with Iron Hustlers um, at uh, the total bid amount of $32,000 for that change order. Questions? Yeah. This doesn't disturb any of our driveways to get to the street, does it? They'll actually tunnel and we'll be trudging through the trenching park, underneath. parking lot, not the driveway. Okay. And then patching back over. So through asphalt, not that concrete drive. So yeah. we, won't, we won't lose the driveway? No, no, it doesn't affect any of that. We'll have a, a patch through the existing uh, parking lot, but and then we're going to seal coat over it all anyway after we're all done. So, so that would be that west lot. Yeah. Any additional questions? Allison? Cervantes? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. Sherby? Aye. Walters? Aye. Okay. <clears throat> Next is a discussion regarding district boundaries. Dr. Eslin. Thank you. So what we're hoping to get kickstarted tonight, as we said earlier, we were trying to make some decisions. So uh, what we would like to do is get some parameters, some suppositions that you would like us to show next month. The idea would be then in October, we would come back with some example K-4 attendance boundaries. And then if the discussion leads us to where we believe we need to go, we would come back in November for what we would ask for then to be the district attendance boundaries for the next year. So we can start to, to provide some certainty for our parents too, just like we talked about for the staff. So uh, in looking at this, what I'm asking for right now is looking at, for instance, how far from a specific building 
do we want to say is absolutely going to that building? So I'll give you a for instance, just why I'm asking. Because if we just do a, uh, there's no quote unquote fence around a building or a neighborhood, if we control for uh, socioeconomic standing, one of the models that we drew up uh, showed that if you lived on the corner of Dayton and Seminary Street, you would go to Steele. Well, you can see Silas Willard from that house. So using that as a logic, we're like, well, that probably isn't the best idea. <laughs> so why don't we talk about how far away from a building do we want to say is, and we can do different models. So what I was going to recommend was we do eight, uh, four, eight, and 12, and just show you what that would look like. These are blocks. Four, eight, 12 blocks, thank you. Four, eight, 12 blocks from a building and say, if we say, four blocks from a building is absolutely, and then we try to control for socioeconomic standing from there, eight blocks from a building and try to control, and 12 blocks from a building and try to control, just to try to put some logic to it. Uh, to put three examples out there, and we can talk about the pluses and minuses of those. I, don't, I wouldn't recommend going much more than three. I think we could really get kind of uh, paralysis by analysis after a while. But uh, does that sound okay? to come back with next month saying, here's a four block example, here's an eight block example, here's a 12 block example. Yeah, I'd like to see what those look like. And four block isn't very expansive when you think that we only have three elementary schools. Right, right. Uh, but when you try to start controlling for socioeconomic standing so one building doesn't have 10% uh, free and reduced lunch and another one has 100%, you know, as we try to, you know, try to even those out a little bit. Uh, that variance is really kind of going to depend. Um, and I agree with you, the four blocks might not be enough, but I think it's good to show those examples so we can show how that kind of morphs um, and look at, at those examples a, a little bit. And, and just so you know, too, we'll also look at, for instance, uh, if you live in Henderson, odds are pretty good you're going to Silas Willard, even though that's beyond 12 blocks from Silas Willard. If you live in Swagataha, odds are pretty good you're going to King. If you live in Bracken, uh, you can kind of, that can go either way. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to try to put some logic to this too, but just trying to say, hey, uh, these are the hard and fast rules of this scenario, these are the hard and fast rules of this scenario, and it won't make much sense until we look at it. But um, just trying to get some examples out there so that we can have a really robust discussion next month and say, this is what this would look like, this is what this would look like, uh, and we can talk about. Uh, you know, bus routes and transportation and that kind of thing too, so we can kind of get an understanding of how long kids will be on buses, how many bus routes we need, that kind of thing. So obviously we need to do these things, so we might as well get moving on it. And we don't have to decide in November, but if we decided once again by December, you know, the goal should be November. If we're not quite there, we could do it in December and it wouldn't be that much worse. But uh, just trying to get some certainty for some families would be a good thing. Is there anything anybody else would like to see? I don't think you should have to drive past a school to get to your school. Okay. You know. We can yeah, you want to write that down since we'll do it on the transportation software. That's a, yeah, in my last district, you could live, you could drive by two towns that have high schools and go to the high school. It was, right. that was kind of crazy. Um, <coughs> we took those kids, we liked them. Uh, but yes, it is a little bit counterintuitive. So that, that's a great, that's a great add-on. You shouldn't have to drive by a school to go to right. school. Just change the routes and go buy it. <laughs> right. Put you in charge of buses. Yeah, that's a good one too. We'll, we'll make sure that that works out. Anything else? We're, I mean, we're happy to put in whatever. But I think coming back with three scenarios. Yes, I'd like to see what those scenarios look like. Before we make additional. Right. Well, and we'll make sure we present those next month and everybody can kind of see them. So we can see what those look like and, and talk about the pluses and minuses of any of those scenarios. And, you know, we can do whatever. It's once again, just what do we value? And we'll try to figure that out as we go forward. It'll be a lot easier to have that discussion when you actually see uh, the heat map of where the houses are and how that works. How does this account for our mobility rate? And is there a way for us to do a plus minus knowing what we know about <coughs> High mobility rate in the district? That's a great question. Um, we could try to put something in there knowing what we know, but it's a little bit scattershot and random. Um, we know our external mobility rate is about 14%. Uh, 
Um, our internal mobility rate will have to do a little bit more digging. Um, it'll be less if there were less schools, so. though. Well, I'm, right, I'm talking about, right. right. So if we have, you know, if our mobility is, you know, if we have high mobility between King and Nielsen, well, then yes, chances are that that mobility may will see a decrease because King is the only, you know, school in that parameter. But I mean, that's not necessarily the case. We can have mobility between Steel and Silos and, and Silos and King. So I'm just kind of really interested in. And knowing what that could possibly look like. Absolutely, that's a great point. And uh, another thing that I think, in talking to folks, one of the things that I don't, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that we need to make sure people are aware of is just because you attend a school now doesn't necessarily mean that's the school you're going to attend, even if it's staying open. Yes. Uh, because those factors can change too as we as we mess with these, these boundaries. Um, so the, the one I think of most often is Silas Willard. Um, you know, if you attend Silas Willard now, it doesn't guarantee you're going to attend Silas Willard next year, depending on where you live. Um, and uh, and Silas Willard's the smallest building, so you know we're going to have yeah, it will be. And uh, you know, we also have to look at well, some of this is going to be a little bit difficult, and that's why we're going to have to ask for people's patience because we don't know where kindergartners are coming from. We know where our current preschoolers come from, and we can make some educated guesses, but. We're only going to be have to look at this year's kindergarten through third graders to make those decisions, and then we're going to have to make some educated guesses on where kindergarten is going to come from. Uh, so even though we establish boundaries after registration, some of those might not be established just because the population can shift a little bit when you're talking about a fifth of your uh, of a building's population. This is where I get to say, and this is probably the quote that will get picked up: "We are equal opportunity making mad." I mean, <laughs> at this point in the game, folks, at, we're not going to make everybody happy. It's just not possible when you're decreasing from five elementary to three. But the nice thing is, we can say all three of those grade schools will have air conditioning. Yes. Be nice. And nice rooms. rooms and all nice rooms. rooms. Classes of bathrooms. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty great and facilities. And excellent you know, teachers, regardless absolutely. of what elementary school absolutely. you are in. Absolutely. People who care about your student and who are willing to work with them every single day. No question. I wish people would focus on that aspect so much. Okay, any other parameters <coughs> for Dr. Asplund? All right. We welcome people to come or watch or listen next month as we talk about these things. Yeah. We're trying not to do this out in the open. Right. Correct. Please realize that. This is, these are not going to be secrets. Hmm, if only people would hear that message more often. Okay, sorry. I'm on like day 14 on my job, like haven't been home, so I'm a little punch. Okay, next, focus area three, responding to the changing needs of our community. Agenda item A, consider approval of health insurance plan changes. Do I have a motion? So move. Thanks. I'll wait for you. Second. I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> or we could just sit here and not go home. I'll be here all night anyway. All right, Miss Hale. Actually, yeah, I'll take Okay. After I um, So this is something we've been sitting on for a few months. The Health Insurance Committee last okay recommended this change it's removing one of the tiers it's employee plus spouse um, and then it would affect nine employees um, it's really not going to alter the course of the financial future of the health insurance plan at this moment um, we have been waiting on the GEA to write a, an MOU uh, that they concur with this um, and uh, we're still waiting on that but uh, we would like to move forward and like to give our uh, insurance brokers some, some uh, information so that they can start planning for this, uh, that uh, to remove that tier starting January 1st and to give our employees enough notice. Um, and as I said, it won't really cause a financial hardship for people. It's just moving us into an area, statistically speaking, and not our group, okay? But this is st statistically across the nation. Uh, employee plus spouse has been the more costly uh, tier 
and uh, it is not in our District 205 plan, but uh, our insurance broker believes that this is a, a step in the direction to help people understand we're trying to address anticipated future costs because our plan has gone, last year, last month it was at 64%, this month it's at 65%. Um, but it's, it's down to where we feel like we need to take some proactive steps to try to do what we can before we would even talk about any uh, premium increases. So uh, we feel like this is one very small step to be able to do. Questions? For those people watching uh, that may not know, can you explain what an MOU is? Uh, ah. Memorandum of Understanding. So uh, the contract is a little vague in this area. And I, that happens. Um, you can't plan for every eventuality. But uh, the contract language says things like, you will do these things when this happens, you will do this when that happens. Um, the insurance committee is comprised of members of every union plus board of education plus administration. And the insurance committee, I think I can say unanimously, right? Mm -hmm. uh, unanimously said that this was a good idea. So we feel like the decision has already been made by the representation that was on that committee, um, but we felt like it would be a good gesture on everybody's part if if the GEA, because it's the, there are two other unions, but they agree that whatever the GEA decides they're going to do, so that's how it works in the, in the insurance committee. Um, it would be a good gesture if the GEA had a memorandum of understanding that we signed uh, jointly to say we all agree with this, because that was the reflection of the vote that day in May that everybody agreed with this decision, uh, that it was a proactive measure that could be taken to try to uh, keep the fund fiscally solvent for much longer um, because we like our insurance and we'd like to keep it basically what it is and this seemed like a small step to try to do that um, without really harming any members. Is that a fair summary, Rod? Yeah, that's an excellent summary. Any other questions? And per the contract, after it's below 60%, we need to take more possibly drastic measures. Correct. correct. That is correct. But last month we went, we brought in $100,000 more than we put out. Right. So last month we were at 64%. Now we're at the 65. previous 12 months, and now we're at 65. And a year and a half ago, we were at 132. Correct. Yes. And we knew when we went to the new insurance that there would be some drag on the plan uh, because of some changes that had to be made to the plan. Um, that was not, this was not unknown to us. We, we knew that this eventually would happen, or at least presumed that it would happen. Any other questions? Allison. Hi. Yes. Rodriguez. Aye. Sherby. Aye. Walters. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. Next, <clears throat> discussion regarding cell phone use. Dr. Aslan. Thank you. Uh, we put out a survey about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, to the staff regarding cell phone use. And, uh, and what you, was it? Well, we sent it to everybody, okay. but uh, you know there are people identified if they didn't have it in their school. And uh, I believe the results, I'm not looking at them at this moment, I believe the results are 52% believe they should never be there. 44% believe that there were some cases where it was fine and then there were another smaller percentage that thought it was fine all the time. Uh, and lots of different comments on there. Um, our, our current district policies, there are two policies that discuss cell phones. They uh, give us the latitude to do basically whatever we want. Currently, the the decision is basically left up to the teacher, although I haven't asked him to do this, but Mr. Spring, do you want to come up real quick? Because you sent me some interesting information about what you've done at North. Sure. I wasn't prepared to present. Right, but I know you can do this right off the top of your head. Jason Spring, 2050, not your <laughs> uh, So, this is my ninth year as, as principal at GHS North, and I have been a huge proponent of allowing kids to have their cell phones because I think it's our job and responsibility to teach them to be responsible with them and to use them, you know, responsibly. Uh, I will tell you 
that my mind over the last couple of years has been changed a little bit um, because you know we're seeing them as, as much more of a distraction. Uh, teachers are having a hard time getting through lessons with kids because they're constantly redirecting the kids, put their phone away. We saw last year a number of uh, more uh, failures of classes because kids are spending more time Snapchatting on Facebook and, and you know and things of that nature. We saw an increase in, in drama and bullying um, because of the Snapchat things that kids were posting during class and you know, I have tremendous teachers at North. Um, they don't sit behind their desk as do, you know, the majority of our teachers are great in, in District 205. So my teachers are up moving around all the time, but those phones were such a problem. Um, so my staff came to me at the end of last year and said, can we just get rid of the phones? And I again said no, because phones aren't going away. Every kid has one years ago, nine years ago, you know, not every kid had a phone, so it was kind of easier just to say, you know, keep them put away. Um, and so this year, we, on day one, um, told the kids in our opening meeting that um, we call it phones away for the day. So when they come in in the morning, uh, when we start school at 9.05, they're to put their phones in their lockers and, and, and go through their first two periods with no phone. So then at lunch, we allow them to get them out and, and kind of have them for half an hour to check their messages and things like that. And then the phones go uh, back away. And I can tell you that uh, we've only had one instance, and that was on day two of a young lady who had her phone. And I had to deal with that and, and was dealt with quickly. And, and since then, knock on wood, uh, we haven't had any issues. The drama has gone down. <coughs> Teachers are able to get through their lessons. Kids' grades are better. Um, the environment is better. Um, kids have reported, and I think I, that was in my email to Dr. Asplund and the other administrators, was um, a young lady said to me, I am so glad that we keep our phones put away because I'm able to focus in class and not worry about the drama. And she was one last year that we had, you know, tons of drama. They just, here, here's the thing, you guys know this, um, there's just so much stuff that goes on outside in our community that kids can't even be a kid for seven hours during the day because they're just constantly being bombarded with messages from their parents, from their family, from their friends, all this drama nonsense that this goes on. And it's, it's, it's sad um, that you've got, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kids that can't focus on school for six hours because of all the stuff that's going on. So, you know, it's been a, a neat trial for us so far. Um, you know, I'm hoping Midterm is, is, is coming close, and you know I'm keeping tabs on grades, but I don't see as many failures in there, and kids, you know, but it just hasn't been an issue. So I, I really thought on day one I would have a lot of groans from the kids, but we just laid it out, you know, and said it's, it's for your benefit, and, and so far it's been working. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I, I guess my biggest thing when I sent my email was that, you know what, kids can actually live without their phones for you know, two and a half hour chunks at a time, and they're okay, you know. Uh, and one question that was brought up, you know, that I addressed with some parents, you know, a lot of times parents say, well, what if there's an emergency, I need to be able to get a hold of my kid. Some parents have my own cell number, so they text me, or they, you know, or their kids, you know, I have a kid, we have some, you know, some young ladies who are, you know, um, expecting, pregnant, and so I allow them, if they need to, you know, check a, a message from the doctor, we, we're not just saying absolutely, you can't have your phone, but during class, it's kept in their locker, and we'll give permission to go get it. And so, it's, it's working so far. Any questions? Okay. So. Thank you, Mr. Springer. You're welcome. Thank Thank you. Your cuff. You, bet. you hadn't sent me a nice email about that. I thought that was worth sharing. Um, so, as I've said here before, and I'll say again, I don't believe, I believe the board has policies to cover whatever eventuality we want. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know that we need to have a change of policy. Um, I think the, the question is, you know, how much do we want to, it's a legitimate question, it sounds loaded, how much do we want to get involved in what happens, what the decision is in a building? You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think, Whatever the building's expectation is, it should just be made sure that everybody knows what it is, that everybody's in, it's enforced evenly. You know? and, and I would hope that that expectation would come from input from staff, certainly, 
that you know is having to deal with this every day. Um, that there's, I've heard compelling arguments both ways personally. Um, you know that there's uh, so many distractions students are getting, and they already have a Chromebook and they have the upper grades, and they don't really need it. Um, but then there are some other teachers who have said, "Well, we actually use them in class because there's things a Chromebook can't do." So. Um, you know, it's hard for me to sit here and say you absolutely have to do one thing or another. Um, so, you know, it sounds like a cop out, but you know, as I said, I'm an English teacher, so uh, I'm all for free discussion and people doing what they believe in. So, and then I think we have the policy mm -hmm. to cover it as it exists now. Absolutely. But it does seem as though most teachers don't want you know the, the cell phones to be a distraction in the classroom. Right. And Mr. Spring has demonstrated, you know, how effective that is. And it can be done. Right. So it can be done. Sure. And he can he can also adjust for, you know, special needs, you know, as needed. Right. And there's like many of these comments that the teachers have made in their they have phones in their classrooms. There's a phone in the office if you need something. Like if the parent has to get a hold of you. They can call the school office. Yeah, that used to happen. I know, my mom did it, yeah. and it works so, just fine. You can send a note home, home note with your child to school. Like, but a lot of them are for apps, at this, at that, like, I guess I don't get it. The calculator, um, go buy one at Dollar General, Dollar Tree. You don't need to use your calculator. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if there's something educational on the phone, and oh, and I think that's you know by the teacher's discretion to right. utilize it. But if they don't want to have the phones in the classroom, I hope the administrators would support that. Yeah. And, I just don't want to hear the yeah. well. I didn't have time to run back to my locker, but this teacher let me have it, right. so I'm sorry that I didn't have time to put it in my locker. Then that teacher's in a hard call. Like, do I really discipline you? Do I let you right. slide this time? I think that's the challenge. <laughs> I, I do agree. The board has issued policy, and our role is to issue policy and buildings and administrators um, to figure out what that procedure looks like and what's best for them. Because if we start making decisions about your procedure, you're going to get mad because we're not in your classrooms every day, rightfully so. Um, so this is a decision, I think, that's best made at the building level, but I would say that it has to be a decision that everyone's on board with and the fact that there's some kind of consistency in it because that there is so much variance between teachers. Um, I would also hope <clears throat> that if someone's making a decision that there's not going to be classrooms or I mean cell phones in the classroom that that would also apply to the teacher at the front of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want a cell phones in your classroom and students on their cell phones while you're trying to teach, um, then I would hope that your cell phone is then also put in your drawer. Might not be a popular opinion, but. And a lot of the comments are, well, their Chromebooks are dead. Well, charge your Chromebook. Mm -hmm. Like, that's your responsibility to have it charged. I'm sure your phone's charged. We're gonna have to build more outlets on the Yeah. yeah. Are we going to have charging stations in our classrooms? It might be a yeah. subject. Any additional information to provide regarding this conversation? We can't really do anything. We've done what we're supposed to do. I think it's a building level decision. And people within the buildings need to work through it. And right, we don't want to teach our, make our teachers cell phone police so there needs to be cooperation among their peers absolutely well and, and i as i said i know this sounds like a cop out but i really do believe it if a teacher doesn't want it in their classroom they absolutely should have the right to ban that in their classroom if a teacher thinks they should have it in their classroom they should absolutely have the right to allow them to have it in the classroom i mean that's we trust the teachers to make those decisions and i would support you know both of those decisions if they had good reasons for doing it they should be able to do it okay. Right. Next agenda item. Consider approval of the press policies. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Are there any questions about the policies? This is second reading, so we would pass these tonight. 
anything in particular, I don't think there was anything, right? So for those of you who are unfamiliar, press policies are things that the state mets down to us based on legislation that has been changed or approved recently that might impact policies that we already have on our books as school boards. And so we have time to review those policies, make sure they fit in with our current policies or if it will contradict a policy that we have and whether or not we have to decide on changing multiple <coughs> policies in that process. So, all right. <clears throat> If there's no questions or comments, Allison? Rodriguez? Aye. Sherby? Aye. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Aye. All right, next, consider approval of District um, 205 budget. Do I have a motion? <coughs> Second. This is it. Okay, I just wanted to update the board on a couple numbers. Uh, I presented this PowerPoint last month on the proposed budget. We've had some numbers that have been tweaked just in a small manner um, in terms of the revenue side and a few expenditure items um, based on some adjustments that our auditors made um, just in the last month. So I'll just kind of go through these quickly here. Um, so we're looking at this slide, which is a comparison of the FY20 proposed budget versus FY19 budget. Um, in the education fund, we're looking at the end of the year um, having a estimated surplus of $325,488. In operations and maintenance, debt service, transportation, IMRF, and capital projects, as well as tort and fire prevention and safety, you'll see that we are deficit spending. But all of these are strategic deficit spends because we have met either our board goals, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we have in certain funds like IMRF, um, tort, um, fire prevention and safety, we cannot transfer those funds to any other um, funds within the budget line items. So keeping large reserves in those funds isn't necessarily very productive. It can't be used for anything else. So we're spending those down um, in a strategic manner. And um, the only one that we haven't talked about here is working cash and you know working cash is Kind of our piggy bank and we may need to use those funds uh, for parts of the project later on when we move to a summary so the ad fund is obviously our largest fund um, that's where the majority of our salary employee benefits come from as well as our purchase services so this is just a breakdown from salaries um, from fy20 compared to fy19 um, our salaries are going to be in the neighborhood of about 29 million they were 27 7 last year uh, employee benefits um, actually dropped a little bit from 3.2 to 2.9 million. Uh, purchase services uh, were up a little in purchase services. Uh, supplies and materials were up in supplies and materials. One of the things that we budgeted for this year for the curriculum office is um, looking at more curriculum materials versus Chromebooks. Um, so Mrs. Springer and some of her committees are looking at how we're going to use that whether that's through textbooks, other instructional resources, but kind of more, more tactile, hands-on things versus electronics, which is, we've been focusing on since 2014. Um, capital outlay, you'll see a large drop in capital outlay because we are doing renovation projects in all of our buildings, so the need for capital outlay is um, built into those projects. Um, other objects have dropped as well, and those um, tend to go hand-in-hand -hand with the building project and then non-capitalized assets are about the same. So we're looking at an overall expenditure in the ad fund alone of 38.3 million versus 37.4 million, so about $900,000 more um, than we saw last year. Um, this is just a review of our fiscal and business management policy. So we had twofold. Number one, we're looking for operating with 180 days of cash on hand in our operating funds and then also two to one revenue to fund balance ratio. So there's kind of two separate goals. Oops, there we go. So for the first goal, operating with 180 days cash on hand in ad fund operations and maintenance and transportation, we have met those goals in all three, as well as in the revenue to fund balance of a two to one ratio, we have met in the education fund operations and maintenance and transportation. So our fund balances are where they should be per board policy at this point in time. 
Does anyone have any questions? Forgive me if I start crying. <laughs> that was a lot of work. This is uh, a very different picture than we had uh, five years ago when some of our board, well, I guess it's just you, know, just just members of the budget and myself when we came. It was a very, very different picture for the budget that year. It was very, very different. Thank you for all your hard work. Any questions? Just as an area of clarification for everybody, um, anybody here out there. So if any of these assumptions change by more than 10% statutorily, we need to do an amended budget later in the year. So it could come to pass that things happen that we couldn't predict. Uh, so if that does happen, then uh, we would come back and, and offer an amended budget in the spring. Any other questions? Allison. Sherby. Aye. Walters. Aye. Sorrentos. Aye. Lyon. Yes. Rodriguez. Aye. <clears throat> Next up, we have consider approval of the GABC budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I believe the name on the agenda says Mr. Houston. Is that Mr. Houston or? It, it is. It is. <laughs> so that is Mr. Houston. <laughs> I really don't have anything to add. There's no changes to the budget. The, the only good news is that the Perkins uh, grant and the CTI grant was accepted at the state level, which means that it's accepted with us. So those are our two funding uh, platforms, as well as the enrollment and our enrollment's been pretty. There's no changes in enrollment this time either. And last month you showed a balanced budget, basically zero and zero. Yeah, right. right. So that was given those assumptions with those grants. So now we can say yeah, absolutely. looks pretty good. Yep, that just came in this week. So, no uh, added money, but the good news is no less money either. <laughs> but you do have a reserve that we are going to then finally get to use. Yeah, well, the so exciting news is that we've been working with Jen about some vision that we've had for some space at the high school for some of our vocational programming as we look to the future about the, the new Perkins funding formula is based on relevant uh, funding uh, programs that are relevant to our region of high wage and uh, high, uh, high need. So uh, we have to do a review of all of our programming and figure out if there's any programming that we're offering that we need to get rid of that no longer fits our region as far as uh, workforce goes. So really what they're saying is we're not gonna fund a program that has no outlook in, in, it, in our county, which is smart. Uh, and so we'll do that work starting now. Dr. Asma has charged me uh, to get something done rather quickly moving forward with now the new 712 concept and how we how far we look at getting a reach below us and then the capstone experience above us. So, any questions? There's a teacher shortage here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're kind of like a college with what we do sometimes that adjunct professor. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to, we work in provisional areas. So uh, the good news is uh, we've been able to fill most of those spots. Uh, we had one that was lingering, but I think we're going to get that filled this week. And GABC through vocational work, though, that's a kind of a different certification path as yeah. well. So it has to do with work hours in the profession. So usually about 2,000 yeah. work hours in the field in order to get your certificate to teach. So, um, like I said, we're fortunate enough to be almost be fully staffed, except for one that's lingering. And we'll, uh, Miss Springer, I talked to her this tonight, and I think that uh, we're going to be filling that as early as uh, next week. Mm -hmm. All right, Any thank you. Any questions, no? Nope. Allison? Alters? Aye. Sorrentos? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. Aye. Okay, we already voted on agenda item F, so we'll go to G, discussion regarding activity funds and the new state law requirements. Dr. Asplund. Thank you. I will start. I've asked Luke uh, to come prepared to make some statements. We have... Um, We've had some lingering ongoing issues here uh, regarding what makes a school club and what doesn't make a school club. And uh, that is kind of enmeshed with this other uh, law change, I guess, regulation change, uh, regarding how we have to audit our funds, our activity funds. So we have district funds that we just talked about tonight with the budget. But then outside of that, you have what are called activity funds, and those funds are raised by building, typically by club, by group. And those funds are held a little bit differently. And there's always been, well, I shouldn't say always, 
For many years, there's been a separate requirement for how you report those funds, but now the general uh, accounting standard board is going to uh, change those rules. So, Luke, I turn the floor over to you. Right, so as Dr. Osborne said, the uh, regulatory change that sort of brought this issue to a head was statement number 84 from the GASB, which is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. It's the entity that sets the accounting rules for public bodies. If anybody wants to read statement 84, I've got it here. It's fascinating. <laughs> Sarcasm, uh, right? Just a little bit. It, effectively, what uh, GSB has done is they've applied a fiduciary standard to funds that you're holding for uh, student groups. So, for example, if your uh, junior class raises money for a particular project uh, or for activities, uh, it's changing how those funds have to be managed and reported. Uh, that's an issue that's largely going to fall upon your auditor, and we're happy to work with your aud auditor on implementing that. Uh, but that's that's mostly on the audit and accounting side. The legal side of that is is the question of what makes a school club. When is an unofficial club actually a club? Uh, you have a number of entities, and this primarily arises at the high school, uh, as you would expect, because you have more student clubs and activities at the high school level. Uh, but you have a number of entities uh, that are semi-organized and have a volunteer faculty sponsor, which is fairly common in high schools uh, in other districts as well. Um, so even though those are, are not uh, maybe as official as an athletic team, those very much are district-sponsored clubs. Um, you're in, in terms of what makes a club, there's, there's no standard test for when you have to create a club or when you have to grant a request to form a club. Uh, the district's not permitted to use any type of viewpoint discrimination in whether you can or can't have a club. Uh, so for example, if you uh, have a request for uh, you know, high school Republicans and high school Democrats, you couldn't say no to one and yes to another. Uh, you can uh, adopt a policy or create a policy that, that uh, sets some reasonable requirements for how many students uh, you need before you're going to start a new club. So uh, you don't have to create a club just because two students want one. You can uh, impose some you know, reasonable thresholds. Uh, and we've seen other policies where there's a, you know, a certain interest level that has to be met and then students have to you know, be able to find a faculty member willing to be a, a volunteer faculty sponsor. The faculty member's job is primarily to supervise the activity when, when those clubs meet. But there's no explicit or bright line test on uh, a numbers game in terms of when you would have to create a club. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the general takeaway from this GASB regulatory change is that uh, most likely the activity funds for the majority of your clubs will have to be pulled back uh, onto the district books and under district control. So some of those clubs that may have managed their own activity funds um, with a little less supervision are probably not going to be able to do that anymore. Uh, it's a, a standard over form test uh, that the GSB rule implies, but my guess is because most of your clubs will have some type of administrative uh, involvement in the expenditure of funds, they will need to be pulled under back under the district's umbrella. Even clubs that we, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Even clubs that we're not sanctioning as in, uh, by granting a differential if you're a volunteer club, their funds still should be administered through our central office. That, that's correct. So the, the ruling doesn't make any differentiation on, on, on whether there is a differential or not. So, so what you have here is, is fairly common in that a number of schools will have uh, differential assignments for some clubs and other clubs have been voluntary assignments. Um, and, and that's perfectly acceptable uh, and could be changed through bargaining if need be. Uh, but that would not remove the fiduciary aspect to the funds for that club, so, so it would still be covered. The rule actually even applies to uh, third-party <coughs> funds. So for example, if the school district were to hold funds for a scholarship, 
Uh, in some districts, the school district will actually hold uh, PTO funds for the PTO. You don't do that here, so that doesn't apply to you. But the, the ruling is actually broader. But the, to answer your question, whether it's a differential uh, position or a volunteer position wouldn't change the analysis. So this doesn't impact our PTOs, or athletic boosters? Not if the district is not managing those funds. If those are separate entities, those are separate entities. And then Luke, can you uh, give the, the plain language example for how we could kind of simply determine whether they're a school sponsor club or not? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the rule of thumb I use is if they're in, their, in your yearbook, they're, they're your club. Um, so even even if it's a it's a volunteer, um, you know I, the examples that come up frequently are uh, you know FCA, GSA, junior class, things like that that, that may be loosely organized. But if uh, thespians, groups like that, if they're in your yearbook, it's it's your club, essentially. That's so that's we the, need to hold their funds and we need to report them as Gatsby has said we need to report Yeah, I mean, we'd have to work with it. That it's possible that there's an exception in there, but most likely they're all gonna, those funds will need to come back under the district's umbrella. And their fundraising is reported on our budget. Do we currently have <laughs> clubs that would be impacted by that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we do. A few. Do we know how many? Oh. Um, no, I don't. Um, we'll have to get, and Mr. Houston and Mr. Matthews and uh, Ms. Ritchie will have to It'll be almost all entirely <coughs> GHS clubs. There may be some church on Lombard. We may have some issues there. I don't. I can't think of any elementary ones. But um, yeah, we will have some work to do to make sure. But you know, we can do it. And I've spoken to the auditors regarding this. And uh, activity funds will actually become part of the education fund. So it'll be housed in there. So I mean, it truly is different than how we're managing them now. Right. We have a process where you know we're <coughs> monitoring. The process and monitoring the transactions and making sure they comply with board policy but there's very little oversight in terms of fundraising as you've mentioned or expenditures <coughs> and things like that but now that it falls under the education fund there's a whole different level of accountability that will have to go into place um, with expenditures and things of that nature so but it's probably appropriate because the, the community is trusting us through this group that is under our imp our their schooled groups so they it's a reflection upon the entire board so if they're buying a candy bar from some child they want to make sure the funds from that is really going to that activity well and that yeah so that that brings up another point that um we have and it depends I mean, we have a lot of different activity accounts but we have some accounts that have really healthy fund balances and and typically i'll use that term loosely but typically activity funds are zeroed out i mean they're that you raise the money that year to spend that year unless you have some long-term goal uh, yeah the band uniforms or um you know they want to do um i'm trying to think of things i've done in the past where um, you know, the baseball team wanted dugouts in the district I used to work in and we weren't going to pay for it. You know, that, that type of thing. Um, but other than long-term goals, typically those funds are <coughs> fundraised that year to be spent that year. And so that, if that is the direction we go, that's going to be a big change for some of our groups because they've, they've been carrying these large balances for a long time. And so it could come to pass that we're telling them, well, you're not fundraising until that thing's spent down. I mean, because that's another thing that we've tried to explain to to our our building folks is look you're, you're not getting the concerns from the community that we're getting of hey i've getting hit up time and time and time and time again for fundraising and, and can we can we try to put a fence around that a little bit and so um there are going to be some necessarily there are going to be some changes to how we do fundraising just because of this regulation change remember what i said earlier equal opportunity make people mad Fortunately, it's not our fault this time. Right. No, this is, but it, it did force our hand to to start to discuss this, and so I felt like this was a good time to at least get everybody some cursory knowledge of what, what the kind of the playing rules are. And I, I thank Luke for doing that homework for us. Thank you, Luke. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> Next up, we have the differential committee report, Mrs. Ham. 
Um, well, we don't have much to report other than the fact that uh, we're going to be bringing back hopefully a recommendation next month on differential committee. We've been meeting since I believe February, the first part of February. Um, we've come up uh, with a formula which we feel is fair. We want to obtain some feedback from club sponsors and activity sponsors and coaches. And so um, Mr. Sherpy and Mr. Matthews and Mr. Ulrich are going to hold a joint meeting next week to kind of roll out the formula, show what the proposed stipends are for um, these clubs and activities and um, kind of look at the student interest surveys. We are proposing bringing back some clubs and activities that we had to cut a couple of years ago because of budget reductions and then also adding um, some clubs and activities um, that students expressed interest in. We did a student interest survey last year at the junior high and the high school. So um, I appreciate everyone's hard work. It's been a long time in coming, but hopefully we'll have a recommendation to bring forward next month. And for those who may not be familiar with the term differential, can you explain what that is? Sure, a differential is um, an amount of money that a teacher or a community member is paid to be a club sponsor or coach um, or host an activity. So it's basically their salary, but it's a set amount. And most of our, well, I think all of our differentials are negotiated through the um, GEA contract. Any questions or comments? I'm glad you guys are meeting next week. Hope it goes well. Wish you could be. I'll be out of town. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> next up is consider approval of the school improvement plans. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Mrs. Springer. So per the board policy and procedures, we are to present these to you every September. Um, so these are the initial plans. That as always, we have a quality uh, school improvement process, so we're always looking at how we can improve these. So these are not going to stay the same. They will be, they're dynamic, and so they'll be changing as the data rolls in and as we look at processes and information. Um, so these are kind of a preliminary view of the school improvement plans. Um, I know some of the committees have been able to meet once, some have been able to meet twice, so they're kind of in different stages of the game. But these are to be presented to you in September, and we'll bring them back again in May with some updated results. Thank you. Yep. Questions? Um, the only one I have, Ms. Springer. Yes. In light of the, some of the conversations, right, we've had Gorski come and some of the other conversations that we're having around equity and inclusion. I am interested in, it looks like, and I just did a quick perusal, I'm going to be honest. Um, it looks like just about every school has something related to diversity and inclusion. And I'm just, I am interested in knowing where those conversations are at. I want to know how we're viewing, right, because those terms can mean a lot of different things. Um, and I, I want us to be cognizant of what all we are looking at, like, right, um, when it comes to that. Just, you know, I'm looking at some of the language in, in some of the reports that are read and I'm just curious as to what that means. So there may be some opportunity that you and I sit back and, and have a conversation because I'm, I'm just curious because as we attempt to make better efforts in this arena in our schools, I also want us to do our due diligence about being intentional and not tokenizing our families and our students in that process that it is um, not just good intention, but we're also paying attention to the impact and, and doing our due diligence as the educators and the lifelong learners instead of looking to parents or families or kids in the classroom to be the person that is being the spokesperson for whatever culture identity that we are trying to um, incorporate into our classrooms. I couldn't agree with you more. One of the pieces that we're working on throughout this school year is development of that equity plan for the district. I always believe in the philosophy of the more you know, the better you can use that information and make some steps towards achieving that goal. So one of the issues that we're tackling this year is building the equity plan with Dr. Gorski so that we as this leadership team then in year two can go through and do some actionable pieces. So it's not just, like you said, like in verbiage, 
we're actually going to put this through. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Allison? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. Sharpie? Aye. Walters? Aye. Ms. Pronto? Aye. <clears throat> Next, we have consider approval of the trip request. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Dr. Eslin. Thank you. You see largely their uh, FFA requests, um, but uh, I believe the information is all right there. Are there any questions you have about any of those trips? This per board policy, whether they're overnight or out of state, they need to be given pre approval. Mm -hmm. No questions, Allison? Rodriguez? Aye. Shirley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Next up, agenda item 10 personnel. Consider approval of job descriptions. Do I have a motion? Second. Are there any, well, Dr. Espen? Uh, yeah, just very briefly. So now that we have a, an HR director, we're going through every single job description. <laughs> and so this is going to be a standing uh, item for quite some time. And we've been getting back some suggested edits from our staff when they return their job descriptions. We want to know from them. We want the job descriptions to reflect what they actually do. So um, some of them have been updated pretty recently and some haven't been updated in a very long time. So we're just trying to get through every single one and update them as we go. So uh, there will be quite a few as we go. As you see this time, most of them are differential positions, but uh, we'll be getting into every position before it's done. Questions from board members? Allison? Rodriguez? Aye. Sherby? Aye. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Next, consider approval of the personnel report. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions from board members? Okay. Allison? Sherby? Aye. Walters? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Lyon? Yes. Rodriguez? Aye. All right. Next, we have grievance update. Dr. Asplund. Really nothing to update. We have no new grievances and we've been done resolved. We still have two. One, uh, one item I believe we reported last month is sitting at the arbitrator's uh, desk now. It's supposed to be um, occurring in December. The other one we haven't done anything at all. So, uh, when we know anything, we'll update you. And next, a report on FOIA requests. Thank you. As, uh, is required by our policy and we're making sure we do these uh, the we've gotten the following FOIA request in the last month from DRG Holdings from Coventry Rhode Island uh, they're asking for a copy of transportation contracts with our current transportation vendor um, why I don't know what they did and uh, we get a lot of these uh, and then we also got a FOIA request from Dell Tech is submitting a public records request to uh, list of every vendor term annual contract with a future expiration date that has been awarded through the bid RFP process. Uh, we're looking for title description, expiration date, awarded vendor name, and any additional details that are easy to include. Uh, so that's kind of quite a few. But, uh, and that's, they're from Herndon, Virginia. I don't know why they're interested either, but uh, those are the four requests we have this month. Is this new that we're doing this? This is new and by law and policy that we're supposed to do it. So we're going to do it every month. And if there's nothing, we'll say there's zero. But there's almost never nothing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. We have reached some people's second favorite part of the meeting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> comments by the Board of Education. Member Walton. No. Member Rodriguez. <laughs> Member Sherpin. Nope. Number line. Well, last month we approved the city district agreement for services. And as I read it, I thought the public should be aware of one part, and maybe I should have called Jeff about this beforehand, was that the public has use of the field house for public walking during the months between October and April, between 5.30 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. I'm not sure many people in the community realize that, 
and we're taking over for the mall. So I think we're getting a McDonald's then at the field house then? I don't know. But uh, <laughs> but no, that's really good. And I hope people take advantage of it because people sort of make fun of our building in some, sometimes. But it's open to the general public for walking. So I hope the public uses it. And it's in our agreement. Yes, Mr. Matthews. Here. So I'm working, I'm actually, uh, I got a call to Tony tomorrow to kind of talk about the parameters of that. Last year it was in there. Um, we didn't have anybody use it the whole year, but we had one person so far this year request access. So now we've got to go through how we're going to go about making that happen. So uh, we're, we're going to have that conversation tomorrow. That's great because I want, you know, it's the community's time and that's before students are there. So I hope you can make it work for everyone. Theoretically, it's before our students are there, but aren't there athletic practices? Uh, potentially, yes. Um, like I said, we gotta, we got to kind of right. look at it certain days of the week and, and those types of things. Right, because if there's athletic practices, and so that would mean community members are around students, which would mean then they'd have to check in and be background checked, background checked right. per the other state law. Hmm. <laughs> See how that works? We agreed to it. I know, <laughs> and I'm not saying it, I, that I don't want to agree to it. I'm just saying that <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than just unlocking the door and saying, do a couple laps. Uh, I have one more item. Yes. Uh, based on an invitation from Mr. Sherpy, I attended a tennis match and I enjoyed it. Yes. yes. Good job. We, we I'm so proud of you. I even went to the football stadium one time, too. So I'm done for the year, right? No. <laughs> But, and, and also in that agreement is the city's responsibility for the lights and all. And I think those lights are in terrible shape and they probably need to look at them and update them. <laughs> we would appreciate it. <laughs> so as you speak to the city, but it was nice and they had a nice, uh, it was nice to have a tennis match. End of the comments. Thank you. As Member Rodriguez has just stated, even though she passed in her comments, yeah, she did <laughs> she did say that the band uniforms looked great. Yes, the parade looked very nice. Yes. So my yes, great. My comments. I want to um, I want to say thank you to those who attended public comment today. Um, as Dr. Asplund has said many times, democracy is messy and we do want to hear from people. Um, and I want to say thank you to the, to the members of the staff at the high school who have been supportive of our students through um, a particularly difficult situation that was ended up being meted out over public social media. Um, and while the family is not here, I want to thank them for their bravery through this time. It is not an easy thing to be put into a spotlight because of who you are. Um, and that is great strength. Um, and I hope that people take some time to learn some new things. Um, and understand uh, that people are people and we all have feelings. And it's not just rooted in our own lived experience, but that when we join a community, we have a responsibility and a commitment to everyone that belongs to that community. Um, so thank you. And um, I'm looking forward to some of the professional development that will be meted out around um, that particular and other areas. Um, thank you to the teachers um, who are working diligently with breakfast in the classroom. Um, I know that it can be challenging for some, but um, it is important for us to make sure that all of our students have a full belly as they start to learn in their day, and the data does not lie. So um, thank you to those who are um, doing their best to make that, pro that program work, um, because the reality is, hey, we have to, because the state said so. Yep, five o'clock. Time to go. Um, and I think, seriously, they just, they're like, Tiana, stop talking. The lights are telling me to shut up. All right, so that'll be it. So any other future items from, agenda items from board members? I want to look at Kane again next month. <laughs> <laughs> Facetious. Okay, 
Um, future meeting date and time, October 14th at 7 p.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Allison. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.